Okay, we'll get underway. So welcome again to the ASCG webinar series. Today, we're very lucky to have Dr. Jack McCubbin talk to us on using airborne gravity data to improve the Australian model of zero heights. Before we start, I have some uh, introductory slides that I just want to bring to your attention. <clears throat> And uh, none of these webinars could be possible without our Corporate Plus and Corporate Sponsors. Corporate Plus being High Size, Total Seismic and Velsize, and Corporate being Southern Geoscience Consultants, Transparent Earth Geophysics, Santos and GUG. On top of that, we have all our branch sponsors of the ASCG across South Australia, Northern Territory, Western Australia, New South Wales. Unfortunately, there's no sponsor for ACT, so please uh, talk to me afterwards if you'd like to uh, help the ACT branch provide you with more webinars, etc. And remember that uh, Jack will talk for approximately 25 to 30 minutes. Please keep your questions to the end of the talk and put them through the Q&A section, not uh, the chat box, please. And uh, I'm sure that there'll be some time at the end of the talk uh, to answer the questions. Coming up on Tuesday, 13th of April, 12 p.m., we have Anand Ray talking about learning to learn about the Earth using Bayesian inversion. <clears throat> and Wednesday, 21st of April, Dr. Vavik Harish Ladia talking about shallow mantle convection beneath West, Af West, West Africa and source to sink at continental margins a novel approach to reservoir prediction in offshore deep water settings. I point out too, all the wonderful benefits you get through the ASCG membership, uh, free access to exploration geophysics, free copy of preview, reduced entry to AGC conferences with the next one coming up in September, free entry to regular technical events in your state, access to job advertisements, the fantastic wine offer, social events in your state, foster a professional network, research funding and travel scholarships for students and free membership for students and half price for retirees. So just remember all those goodies if you're not a member already. And also you can find us, talk to us, hear us through monthly email newsletters, through Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube. <clears throat> So before we go, before we hand over to, to Jack, in 2016, Jack was awarded a PhD in geophysics from Victoria University of Wellington for his work on the collection of national wide airborne gravity data set, producing a new series of national gravity grids and new quasi geoid model for New Zealand. Following this, he came to work at Curtin University as a postdoc working on the development of a new Australian quasi-geoid model with, with uncertainty estimates. Jack later moved to work at GA in the National Geodesy section to assist with the geodetic absolute gravity program and to continue to refine the national quasi sorry, the national quasi-geoid model. Okay, so I'll pass over to, to Jack. Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mike. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, and thanks to everybody that's tuned in to listen. Uh, I'm really excited to have the chance to tell you all about what we've been working on. Um, my name's Jack McCubbin, and I work in the geodesy section at Geoscience Australia. And over the last 10-ish years, I've been working with gravity data to model the geoid. So these are models that are used to help GPS users calculate heights above what's generally called mean sea level. The most recently released geoid model covering Australia was calculated in 2017 using the National Terrestrial Gravity Database, which is hosted by GA, and satellite altimetry gravity anomalies. And using these data, we were able to produce a model which is accurate to around five to eight centimeters. Uh, in 2018, we conducted a survey on user requirements, and we found that the majority of users need to be able to determine heights accurate to five centimeters or better. Um, so the, the model itself is kind of a limiting factor. Uh, so to meet this need, we're, we're now kind of embarking on collecting new airborne gravity data to densify and improve the gravity measurements in key regions and drive down uncertainty in the model. 
So to provide the, the, the main motivation for this work, the Australian government has committed $225 million to provide 10 centimeter accurate or better satellite navigation positions anywhere in Australia. This is being delivered by two projects, a national network of ground station infrastructure known as the National Positioning Infrastructure Capability and a system to deliver corrected positioning signals directly via satellite technology through an Australian satellite based augmentation system. So through this program, GNSS accuracy will be improved to around three centimetres in areas with mobile phone coverage and 10 centimetres everywhere else. So the program will deliver really accurate GNSS positions, but satellite positioning systems give heights relative to an, an Earth approximating ellipsoid. So that's lowercase h in the, in the diagram on the left there. The trouble is these heights are really just geometric and not necessarily intuitive or physically meaningful. Physically meaningful heights are normally referenced to a surface called the geoid. In the past, the only way to determine physical heights was to use differential leveling techniques. So with these methods, the height of a series of points is determined incrementally using surveying instruments and tied off to a reference height somewhere. This is a really accurate way to measure height, but it's a lot more work than just using GNSS. A geoid model uh, of the separation between the geoid and the ellipsoid, so N in the diagram on the left there, um, and can be used by GPS users to convert their ellipsoid heights into heights above the geoid. So what makes heights reference to a geoid physically meaningful? Well, the geoid's perfectly flat. It's a perfectly flat and level surface, and it's been chosen to align with mean sea level. Now, because it's a flat and level surface, if you are able to walk over it, you'd never feel like you're going up or downhill. It takes some energy to walk up a hill because we have to work against the force of gravity. So for example, moving 100 kilograms up by eight meters requires around 7,840 joules. Now this isn't nutritional advice, but that's about the same amount of energy as uh, one Tic Tac. A change in physical height, so going up and down relative to the geoid uh, with some sort of horizontal motion, like when walking up a hill, corresponds directly to a change in energy. And this is what makes these heights physically meaningful. They predict how things will move under the influence of gravity, um, like how water might flow. So they're important for civil engineering, construction, mining, hydrography, environmental studies, and the, the list goes on. If the strength of gravity was exactly the same everywhere over the surface of the geoid, the geoid would be a, a nice regular sphere and I probably wouldn't have a job, but unfortunately it's not. There are subtle variations in the strength of gravity from place to place due to variations in the shape of the earth and its density. We can measure the strength of gravity very precisely using gravity meters. And in geophysics, the gravity measurements are often used to reveal the density contrasts. So this is done by removing the effect of almost everything that can be modeled using constant values for things like the rock density. And the bit that's left over is called a gravity anomaly. So as an example, the, the figure here shows the, the Bouguer gravity anomaly computed recently as part of the 2019 Australian National Gravity Grids. The effect of topography has been removed using a model which assumes a constant rock density value and what's left for the most part reflects density variations. So the most striking signal here is the distinction between denser oceanic crust and continental areas. But to model the separation between the geoid and the ellipsoid, we keep most of the gravity signal in there. We just use the difference between the Earth's gravity and the gravity of the ellipsoid that we want to reference it to or reference the geoid to. So these gravity anomalies are shown in the figure on the left here. Uh, the scale is in milligal, which is 10 to the minus five meters per second squared. And we can see that it's pretty well correlated with the topography. And this kind of makes sense because we've removed only a very simple model of the earth in the ellipsoid. 
So these gravity anomalies are related to the separation between the geoid and the ellipsoid mathematically, and this is depicted in the equations and the diagram on the right. One thing to note, uh, the equation with the integral sign says that, the, uh, says that to model the geoid at any one point, we need to take into consideration the gravity anomalies over a very wide region, technically over the whole Earth. So for this reason, any holes or large errors in the gravity data coverage have an impact over a fairly wide footprint. Another kind of subtle technicality that I'd like to highlight is that to model the actual geoid, we need a map of the gravity anomalies on the geoid itself. And this is sort of, again, illustrated in the equations here. So the, the gravity anomaly, delta G, uh, the point P is on the geoid. So Offshore, this isn't really too much of a problem since we're already sort of on the geoid, but onshore, it's a, a bit more difficult because the topography is in the way. So instead, as a kind of mathematical convenience, we use a, a gravity anomaly at the Earth's surface and calculate a surface called the quasi-geoid. And this is a, a very close approximation to the geoid onshore and identical to it offshore. And it's what's normally been done for geoid models uh, that cover Australia. But I just thought I'd flag that in case you thought in a moment, why does he keep saying quasi-geoid? So in 2017, under CRC SI project 1.24, uh, uh, we, uh, so Geoscience Australia, in partnership with Curtin University, computed a new national quasi-geoid model, AGQG 2017. This is the latest publicly available quasi-geoid model covering the Australian region, and uh, it's, it's been made available through GA. It covers an area from 8 south to 61 south and 93 east to 173 east, which includes Australia's offshore territories and maritime boundaries, and it's available on a, a one arc minute or two kilometer grid. The model is the separation between the quasi-geoid and Earth approximating ellipsoid GRS-80. So there are a few uh, reference ellipsoids around, but GRS-80 is a good choice for positioning, especially in Australia, because it's used in the Australia, uh, Australian uh, geocentric datum GDA 2020. Um, and this means that the quasi-geoid model is directly compatible with GPS or GNSS data. The separation between the quasi-geoid model and the GRS-80 ellipsoid is shown in the figure on the right, and it has variations between minus 50 and 80 meters. Uh, if we were to zoom out a little bit further, we'd see that the geoid to ellipsoid separation is zero on average over the whole Earth. We just kind of happen to live on a part of it where it has this, this kind of northeast-southwest trend. So to calculate the, the model, we first mapped the gravity anomaly across the whole region using the National Terrestrial Gravity Database provided by GA, which at the time consisted of more than 1.7 million terrestrial gravity observations. So here's a figure on the top left there of the, the general data coverage with uh, one data point approximately every 4.3 kilometers on average. And we merged them with the Sandwell and Smith satellite altimetry derived gravity anomalies offshore. So that's shown in the bottom left. These are gravity anomaly maps that are produced by inverting measurements of the sea surface that have been measured with satellite altimetry. And generally they perform really well uh, in open water because the measurements are made at such high resolution and at very regular intervals. In fact, some older gravity data collected using shipboard methods are available offshore in this region, but we opted not to include them in the GEOID modeling because by comparison to the altimetry data, they tend to be a bit poorly georeferenced and often contain biases. The altimetry gravity anomalies are, are normally a bit more reliable. So to grid up all of the data, we use GMT's block mean and surface functions, which are really well suited to the job. And the final grid of gravity anomalies is shown on the right there. We also used a couple of tricks along the way to produce this. We removed topographic effects from the data before gridding and then added them back at the very end. And this 
kind of reduces or mitigates the chance of aliasing the, the gravity signal from the topography, say where the gravity data are only captured in valleys of mountains. We also inspected the coastline to look for any kind of major discontinuities between the altimetry data and terrestrial gravity data, but didn't really find any. So when we model the quasi-geoid, our regional map of gravity anomalies doesn't capture the very long wavelengths. The solution is to use a, a global gravity model as the basis of the model. And these models contain the very long wavelengths of the gravity potential, which for the most part are determined from satellite data. Uh, what's left is just a, a high frequency component. Um, and this means that we can just perform the gravity anomaly to geoid calculations over a, just a, a very local area and not worry about trying to resolve the long wavelengths. Uh, in practice, we calculate a residual gravity signal uh, using uh, as the difference between our, our grid of data and the global gravity model, and then use this to compute a residual quasi-geoid model. So for AGQG 2017, we used EGM 2008 to provide the, the long wavelength signal. So this is a global gravity model, uh, which has wavelengths down to around 10 kilometers. Um, and in the figure on the, the left there, we have our residual gravity anomaly. So the difference between our gravity anomaly map and EGM 2008. And in the figure on the right, we have the residual quasi geoid values. So the difference between our AGQG 2017 model and EGM 2008. So effectively, uh, we, we computed a correction layer uh, to the global gravity model EGM 2008 to better include uh, gravity data over Australia. The, the final residual quasi-geoid signal or the update layer has variations of around, well, up to about 10 centimeters. The real novelty of the AGQG 2017 calculation was that we also computed a, a grid of uncertainty estimates. The uncertainty estimates for the first time let users of the model know how accurately they're determining their physical heights and also gives us a, a good in indication of how accurate our quasi-geoid modeling is. So to produce the uncertainty values, we rigorously propagated the errors or uncertainty estimates of the raw data through each stage of the processing. The National Gravity Database contains uncertainty estimates for the gravity values and all of the positions. And these were propagated through the gravity correction formulas to obtain gravity anomaly uncertainties. And for the offshore areas, the Sandwell and Smith series of uh, altimetry derived gravity anomalies come with uncertainty estimates. And this is partly why we chose that particular marine gravity anomaly. These were all propagated through Stokes integral. Uh, so the, the equation that transforms gravity anomalies into the geoid uh, anomalies. And then finally, concern, uh, con they were propagated through the Stokes integral and then combined with um, uncertainty estimates that accompany the EGM 2008 model. So the image on the right shows the final standard deviation of the, the quasi-geoid model. And generally speaking, it's around five centimeters and flows out to eight centimeters over uh, the Eastern Victorian Highlands. Uh, and this is an area where the, the gravity data are particularly sparse. Offshore, the gravity signal is generally captured quite well and regularly by the altimetry data. And this is reflected in the, the quasi geoid uncertainty being typically better than around five centimeters. So armed with our new quasi-geoid model, the next question we looked to answer was, is it fit for purpose? So in 2018, we conducted a survey to investigate users, user requirements for height determination in Australia. In total, we had about 170 respondents uh, with responses with respondents across industry and government. And the last similar study on user requirements for physical heights in Australia was conducted in 1988, uh, which kind of predates the, the widespread use of GNSS. So our survey was quite timely. So just to summarize two key results, we asked uh, which methods that uh, they use to establish physical heights. 
and 29% of people responded that they used traditional leveling methods. But somewhat to our surprise, more than 50% of the people uh, that responded relied at least in part on GNSS and the geoid model. We also asked what the accuracy requirements generally are. And 75% of the respondents need heights that have an absolute accuracy better than five centimeters. So ideally, the geoid model needs to be better than four centimeters accurate. This would let users establish five centimeter accurate physical heights with three centimeter accurate GNSS positioning and the model. But the, the modeled uncertainty in the AGQG 2017 quasi geoid model is really towards the, the kind of top end of what it needs to be to meet these requirements. So there's a clear need to improve the model that we released. So the accuracy of a quasi geoid model is really limited by how well the gravity signal is captured. And this is really two pronged. The, the first thing to consider is what kind of wavelengths we can resolve with the data we have, bearing in mind that our model is gridded at about two kilometers. Um, so here we've got a plot of the, the gravity data distribution over Victoria on the left and the modeled quasi geoid uncertainty on the right. So in regions where the gravity field is reasonably smooth, we can capture the gravity signal quite well with fewer observations. So for this reason, the uncertainty doesn't blow out where the, the data are quite sparse. Uh, for example, the, the sparser block or region towards the, the northeast, sort of this area. But where the gravity field is both coarse and undersampled, like the Victorian highlands shown here, the, uh, the errors are particularly large. So over this particular region, the errors in the quasi geoid model are, are up to around eight centimeters. The other consideration is the measurement error. So the terrestrial gravity data are generally high quality, uh, accurate to at least one to two milligauss once you've applied the various corrections to compute the gravity anomalies. But offshore, the satellite altimetry derived gravity anomalies are kind of unreliable in the near shore zone, so shallow water areas. This is mostly due to radar reflections from the land and seabed rather than the sea surface. And the uncertainty estimates of the gravity anomalies can exceed 30 milligauss, which is often close to 100% of the signal. So left to right here, we have a figure of the terrestrial gravity data coverage over Adelaide, the altimetry derived gravity anomaly errors, and the final quasi geoid error over the region. And you can see that the quasi geoid, more, uh, quasi -geoid model errors increase uh, onshore where the terrestrial gravity data thin out and right by the coast where the altimetry errors are large. So it's not so much of a problem here, but these errors tend to bleed onshore when we convert the gravity data into a quasi geoid model. Um, as an example, we had a, a fairly big blip in the altimetry data in Port Phillip Bay in Melbourne, uh, which led to around a, a 20 centimeter error in the, in the first draft of this quasi geoid model. Uh, we, we subsequently fixed it by just patching it over with other data, but these, these errors in the altimetry data really do have a real impact. So to improve the quasi geoid model, we need better gravity data coverage at the one arc minute or two kilometer resolution of the, the model and particularly covering errors, areas where the, uh, the existing data are sparse or unreliable, like over mountainous regions and the littoral zone. Scalar airborne gravimetry or, or measuring gravity from the vantage point of a plane meets these requirements perfectly. And it certainly isn't a new idea. Uh, national airborne gravity campaigns uh, for geoid modeling have been conducted in a number of countries. So for example, the airborne gravity survey undertaken in New Zealand, which has a lot of hostile terrain and a large amount of coastline, um, or the, the GravD project collecting gravity data across the whole of the United States. So with airborne gravimetry methods, it's easy to obtain consistent coverage over otherwise inaccessible areas. So in mountains, shallow coastal regions, um, that kind of thing. And it covers large areas quickly and cheaply compared to terrestrial measurements, which are typically conducted on foot or via helicopter and road vehicle. 
Uh, we can also cover the littoral zone easily, where there are large errors in satellite altimetry data and terrestrial or shipborne methods aren't really practical. One thing to note is that airborne gravity data are band limited. We have to apply filtering to them to remove high frequency noise, but generally they contain wavelengths shorter than that of our quasi geoid model. <clears throat> Long wavelength control also isn't too much of a concern because typically we use a global gravity model as the, the long wavelength reference signal when we're modeling the geoid. So in 2019, GA partnered with the South Australian Department of Planning, Transport and Infrastructure, the Surveyor General of Victoria within the Department of Land, Water and Planning and the Geological Survey of Victoria within the Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions to capture airborne gravity data over Greater Adelaide, Greater Melbourne and Eastern Victoria Highlands. <clears throat> These data are being collected to both improve the quasi-geoid model and to advance geophysical modelling over the areas. Although this is probably the first time any gravity data have been collected in Australia with geoid modelling specifically in mind. The surveys are beginning this year and follow more than 18 months of planning and preparation. So these are our two target regions uh, over Victoria on the left and South Australia on the right. Uh, in total, the, the survey area is around 150,000 square kilometers. Uh, and the Victoria region has been split into three main survey zones. The Greater Melbourne area, uh, GM there, the uh, Eastern Victoria 1, EV1, and Eastern Victoria 2. So the reason for doing this is that we wanted to capture the highest, highest resolution uh, data over areas where the gravity field is coarsest. So we're capturing data with flight lines spaced every one kilometer over Greater Melbourne and Eastern Victoria 2, and with flight lines spaced 500 meters over Eastern Victoria 1. So just to also flag, some airborne gravity data have already been collected over Victoria in previous airborne gravity campaigns. So one scalar gravimetry data set over the Gippsland region, which fills in the coastline between EV2 and Greater Melbourne, and another gravity gradiometry data set towards the west, which butts up against uh, the Greater Melbourne survey area. So this effectively covers off the full coastline and the vast majority of areas with a, a strongly varying gravity field. So these data are going to be really useful to improve our geoid model. For the South Australia region, shown on the right there, uh, data are going to be collected along flight lines spaced every five kilometers. And this will vastly improve the quality of the gravity data coverage in the, the near shore zone, um, currently completely determined from altimetry data, which are pretty unreliable here. And they'll also go a long way to regularize the gravity data coverage out towards the east onshore. The data are going to be collected by Sander Geophysics Limited uh, on our behalf using their proprietary AirGrav gravimeter system. Um, and this is a system that meets our accuracy requirements of about one milligal after applying filters. Uh, and they'll be using a twin otter aircraft um, and flight lines are on a, a loose drape surface over all regions and always within public airspace. So in addition to the airborne data, we're also putting together some great ground truth data sets to test the accuracy of the quasi geoid model over these areas. So as I briefly mentioned at the beginning, uh, leveling methods can be used to establish heights above the geoid, whilst GNSS methods can be used to determine heights above the ellipsoid. If we measure the height of the same point by both methods, we can use the two heights to determine the separation between the ellipsoid and the quasi geoid, effectively giving us the same thing uh, as what we determine using gravity data. And this is depicted in the diagram on the left. These co-located height measurements uh, can be used as ground truth data to independently check the accuracy of the quasi geoid model. In Adelaide, uh, highly accurate leveling and GNSS height measurements have been made at 327 data points specifically for this project. And these data can produce quasi geoid values which are accurate to around two to three centimeters at these specific sites. So we'll be using these to validate the improvements we make to the quasi geoid model over Adelaide 
and to confirm that the improved map of propagated uncertainties is realistic. The location of these points is shown in the figure on the right there as the, the black marks. <clears throat> in Victoria, there's an extensive leveling network and a lot of effort has gone into fully digitizing all of the data so that the network can be readjusted as needed. And the, a, a number of marks have already been measured with GNSS, uh, which we'll use to validate the quasi geoid modeling. The hope is that we'll also be able to go in and uh, occupy more uh, existing leveling benchmarks with GNSS equipment uh, in areas where we see kind of appreciable changes in the quasi geoid model after the data have been included. And this will help verify that those, those changes are, are valid and making an improvement. <clears throat> so I have a few final slides here to demonstrate how the airborne data can be incorporated into the quasi geoid model in practice and how the, the model's uncertainty might change. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, some airborne data have all be already been collected over the Gippsland Basin between our Greater Melbourne and EV2 regions. And this area is shown blocked out in the figure on the left. And on the right here are the gravity anomalies uh, of the airborne data over the region with a range of around 50 milligal. And they're shown here at the elevation they're measured, which was around a couple of hundred meters off the ground and with a, about 100 seconds of a long track filtering, um, to, which has been applied to sort of squash any high frequency noise. These data were collected in 2011 by Sander Geophysics Limited on, on behalf of the state of Victoria. And they have uh, one kilometer space flight lines with some infill down to 500 meter space lines near the uh, near shore region. So with these, these flight line spacings, uh, these data should blend really well with the one kilometer space data we're, we're collecting nearby. So to compare the quasi geoid model to this airborne data, uh, we can transform the quasi geoid model back into a gravity anomaly and then upward continue it to the measurement points of the airborne data. So just like when we modeled the quasi geoid, the gravity data uh, with the gravity data to capture the, the full spectrum of the gravity anom anomaly signal, we would really need global data coverage. So again, we've used a similar trick as before and subtract uh, a long wavelength geoid model using a global, global model and just work with the residual signal. So here we've used Gaucher satellite gravity spherical harmonic model to provide the long wavelengths. And importantly, it's independent to AGQG 2017 and the airborne data. So the figure on the left shows the residual AGQG 2017 disturbing potential and on the right, the corresponding residual gravity anomaly of the AGQG 2017 model. So the transformation and interpolation was handled using radial basis functions to parameterize the gravity signal. And with the right choice of functions, which go into creating the, the matrices B in the equations, um, the, the fitted functions can be used to interpolate in three dimensions implicitly handling upward and downward continuation of the gravity signal and also handle the conversions between gravity functionals like gravity anomalies, gradients and the potential. So to compare this to the airborne gravity data, we've also computed a residual airborne gravity anomaly by subtracting the Gaucher derived uh, anomaly from the original airborne gravity anomalies. And this is shown in the figure on the right. And on the left, uh, we have again the, the AGQG 2017 derived residual gravity anomaly at the same 3D locations. And at the broad scale, the, the visual agreement between the, the quasi geoid implied residual gravity anomaly and the residual airborne gravity anomaly is good. The, the, the edges of all the major features seem to match well, and both of them have a, a similar amplitude of 15 milligal. The difference between the two, so the airborne gravity anomaly minus uh, the AGQG 2017 implied gravity anomaly reveals that the bulk of the differences are offshore. And this is where we know the altimetry data are unreliable. And onshore, the differences are largest where the terrestrial data thin out. So the size of the differences is reassuringly small, around five milligal at the extremes. 
short wavelength and approximately zero mean. So this really implies that the AGQG 2017 model is already capturing the gravity signal well, where the gravity data coverage is reliable. The blue spot there onshore with a, a 1.5 milligal difference lies on Lake Wellington, which is the largest Gibson Lake. Uh, and it's a bit of a hole in the terrestrial gravity data coverage. Uh, it's not terribly easy to measure gravity on the surface of a lake by terrestrial methods. So it's possibly why the, the gravity data coverage isn't great there. Uh, there's also a larger three to five milligal difference towards the northeast of Lake Wellington with a similar data gap. Um, and there's another large body of water there and access looks a little difficult, uh, at least what I can tell from what I can tell using uh, Google Earth. So because we have an expression for uh, the AGQG 2017 implied gravity anomalies at the location of the airborne data, one way we can enhance the quasi geoid model with the, the airborne data is to make a, a least squares, uh, weighted least squares update to the model balancing the errors in the quasi geoid model with the errors uh, of the airborne gravity data. So this is provided by the least squares solution to the matrix equation on the top right, where W is the covariance matrix of the errors in the AGQG model and the airborne data. So in the figure on the right here, we can see the difference between our AGQG 2017 model and the quasi geoid model updated with the airborne gravity data. Uh, the airborne gravity data basically introduce around two to three centimeter changes to the quasi geoid model here. In general, combining or comparing airborne and terrestrial gravity data is particularly tricky. Uh, the AGQG 2017 model is a, a kind of a realization of the disturbing potential at the, the topographic surface. Um, so here we've made the assumption that the, the gravity signal is harmonic at the, the Earth's surface and the uh, and the height of the airborne gravity data. So this is uh, it's fairly reasonable in this area where the topography is quite smooth, but residual train modeling methods uh, should be used in areas with the, the coarser topography. So like over the Eastern Victoria and Highlands. Um, so this effectively, well, yeah, the, the effect of topography would effectively be removed uh, from the signal during this whole process and then added back right at the very end. So the uncertainty estimates of the quasi geoid model enhanced with the Gippsland airborne gravity data are shown on the right in meters. Uh, and these have been produced by combining the existing model uh, errors uh, with the airborne gravity error using standard formulas for error propagation. And over the error area where the airborne gravity data are available, we can see that the uncertainty map has been reduced to around two centimeters. And this level of uncertainty is, is much more closely aligned with what our users need. Ultimately, uh, we hope to reduce the uncertainty to a, a similar level over the whole region where the new airborne data are being collected. So just to summarize, uh, incorporating airborne gravity data into the model over our target regions uh, should hopefully bring the uncertainty down from five to eight centimeters uh, to the two to three centimeter level, we need it to align with our, our user requirements for physical heighting via GNSS. The, the next iteration of the quasi geoid model will incorporate these new data and future versions will include all other existing and new gravity data as they become available to GA. Uh, the, the South Australian and Victoria airborne gravity data will ultimately be made available to the public via Victoria's, uh, South Australia's and geosciences, uh, Geoscience Australia's pre-competitive geoscience catalogues uh, for both geodetic and geophysical modeling. Thank you all very much for your time listening this afternoon. Uh, I hope I've provided some insight into the data we're collecting and why and what will be available to you soon. And I welcome any questions you might have. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Jack, for, for what was uh, an elegant and understandable explanation for the uh, determination and the value of the, the, the geoid versus the ellipsoid. I also like the forward modeling for the uncertainty prior to going into a, a new survey. I will start the questions off and I just remind people, please put your questions in the Q&A as opposed to the chat, although I will monitor both. But look, a couple of questions from me, Jack. Uh, you mentioned that 
the federal government is working towards five centimeter accuracy across the entire continent. How does that compare with other countries around the world? It's, that's a, a good question. Thanks for that. Um, so, generally speaking, the the errors of these models uh, aren't aren't kind of put together in the same way that we've done here. Uh, they normally give a blanket error estimate. So. Um, you don't really have this spatial variation. You can't really investigate where the errors might be worse in some places than others. So, for example, the New Zealand model, uh, that's probably accurate to six to six to seven, well, to maybe three, three to four centimeters um, where they've included the airborne data. Before they included it, it was probably good to around five to six centimeters. Um, what we've got at the moment is probably, uh, yeah, on par with what, what's around at the moment, but this this new airborne data will really drive it down to something that's world class. Okay, good. And look, uh, what might be a, a slightly complicated question, but when you use airborne gravimetry to fill in some of the gaps in the ground gravity data to calculate a higher resolution geoid, how do you determine which way to fly, east, west, north, south, or ideally should it be flown on a grid, east, west, and north, south? Um, I, I don't think the flying direction matters as long as the, the kind of, so uh, one, one effect you might see that's dependent on the flying direction is the Erbos effect. Um, but if you take that into consideration, the actual direction of the flight lines isn't particularly important as long as you've got a gravity measurement along the line at each point. Um, a, a grid would be nice so that you can do crossover adjustments and that kind of thing and make sure you haven't got any biases in the flight lines. But um, with kind of modern gravity systems, the, the drifts and um, the biases are, don't tend to be such of an issue. So, yeah, I'd say generally speaking, it probably doesn't matter too much which way the, the, the lines are flown. And okay. well, yeah, unless you're trying to capture, yeah, yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's, that's fine. Look, so I'll open it up to the audience. Are there any other questions there, please? No questions? You've stumped them. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right, final chance. Okay, well look, thank you. Oh, hang on. Well, okay, we've got a couple of appreciations here, Jack, but no further questions. Okay, well, my contact details are there if anybody has anything that comes up later. Actually, I, I do have a question for you from Wayne Hewison. What's the ultimate resolution you're looking to achieve in the data? Well, the, the model is always going to be gridded at one arc minute, at least for the time being. Um, there's not a lot of, um, a lot more uh, high frequency content in there, which is kind of, that you know, anything higher resolution than, than two kilometers for this grid probably isn't worth considering. Um, so yeah, I mean, ultimately we would, it would, the ideal situation would be to have one, one measurement every two kilometers. Um, so yeah, I guess if we could keep pushing and eventually achieve that, that would be wonderful. Okay, and this is a, a question to all panelists, which I can answer. Will this presentation be available as a recording? Absolutely. The ASCG tries to make all these available, obviously with the uh, permission of the, the presenter. And in this case, Jack is more than happy to share this with everyone, so that's fine. Okay. Okay. All right. Some more appreciations and we'd love to show my staff and I'm sure Jack is more than happy to uh, see it uh, disseminated to various other people. Okay. Well, look, we'll leave it there again. Thank you very much, Jack. And uh, yep, we'll, we'll get that presentation on the ASCG website so people can download it and uh, view it again. Thank you. Thank you.